radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. Good evening, everyone. How you doing? Today is Tuesday, though. It's not Monday. Today is Tuesday, February 13th, 2024. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Yeah, we took yesterday off. I had to. It was an amazing weekend. I just got back from the Conscious Life Expo. And uh, yeah, I was planning on doing a show last night. I was going to do my annual recap of CLE. I ended up staying for the post-con. So I stayed the extra Monday, which uh, I've been hosting CLE for 10 years. And it was the first time that I was invited for post-con, which was amazing. But it threw everything off, which also is a heck of a drive back. And I drove, I was on the road as the show should have started. So that's just the way that it is. But I'm here now. So today is the start of a brand new week here on Fade to Black. Help support the show and uh, get yourself a fade to black T-shirt. There are two sheet, two, two two sheets, two T-shirts, and two ways to get them. The links are below. Get a game changer membership, and you will get in addition to your autographed T-shirt. You'll also get fade to black coffee from River Moon. Get your fade to black coffee today. Get your T-shirts. The links are below. It was an amazing weekend. Uh, the conference was packed, and what's interesting about the show tonight, uh, our guest is uh, Bernie Bernie Ta- Bernie J. Taylor uh, tonight, in that um, over and over again, when you have, oh man, uh, the, the, the rough, no, about 10,000 people at the conference, and uh, the, yes, that is large, it was packed, it was fun, it was great to have that many people in one place where you check your ego and your attitude at the door, you come in and just let it all hang out. It was, it was like that. But um, what's interesting about the weekend combined with the show tonight is over and over again, it seemed that the theme for the attendees as well as the speakers and presenters where I have uh, people coming up to me all day long, raising questions, and they have some, is that uh, it is the pursuit of knowledge. And and going back, and I did uh, the keynote address that I do every year on Friday night, and to have a packed room like that, uh, just just standing room only, with with the questions and the comments and the way that it was the ancient secrets panel going back and discussing things like cave art was brought up gobekli tepe was brought up um the, what what the ancients were leaving for us to discover was brought up and discussed from the get go on friday night all day saturday all day sunday all the way through monday And I was so excited about tonight's show because I've got a really good warm-up from the Conscious Life Expo. So we're going to do all of that and much more tonight with Bernie. Tomorrow night, we have Sev Talk here for the first time. Very excited about that. And uh, she's a contactee. Um, She is of service to others, and she has had a life of ET contact, and we will be discussing all of that and much more tomorrow night with Sev Talk. And then Thursday, Dr. Damon Abraham is with us. Again, here we go, my favorite subjects, tech meets 
uh, parapsychology and everything in between. That is going to be Thursday night. And this is what I'm thinking. All right. Now, it's not on the books yet. And I don't want to make promises and where I can't deliver. But I think Friday we should do a Conscious Life Expo wrap-up show. I've got too much uh, on my phone. I've got videos and I've got uh, stories and I've got selfies and images and and everything else. So let me see if I can dial that in and uh, we'll do that on Friday night. I've got stuff Friday day scheduled, but... It's you guys that I want to hang out with. So we'll see if we can swing back and do a CLE, Conscious Life Expo 2024 wrap-up show, because it was absolutely incredible. So with that, tonight, Bernie J. Taylor is with us. We're going to be discussing, amongst other things, but uh, we're going to center around astronomy, mythology, a little map making and our living library of the natural world that was originated more than 35,000 years ago. I think it's much older than that, but we're going to find out much more from Bernie in Africa, the Iberian Peninsula, that area, and, and how we have been rediscovering the same ever since. Bernie, he's an author, he's a speaker, he's a researcher exploring cultural astronomy, mythology, and cave art from the Ice Age. Best known for breaking the source of Picasso's, that's right, mask in his painting, Les Demoiselles de Avignon at the Altamira Cave, and identifying both terrestrial terrestrial and sky maps depicted as animals i'm going to say this part of the show tonight is going to be amazing because what is there what were the ancients seeing in the sky and what were they preserving on those walls we're going to discuss all of that and much more tonight it is are you ready are you ready for this bernie j taylor is with us he is live and looking good there he is bernie how you doing young man i'm doing great jimmy and you're right it's more than thirty-four thousand years ago but the record the the artistic record the nomenclature i can count the 34 easy But of course, it goes back to hundreds of thousands of years. But yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, my sweet spot, my sweet spot is 34 to 12,000 years ago. Everything after 12,000 years ago is a remake. Gobekli Tepe, the Egyptian pyramids, Picasso, Greek astronomy. It's all a remake, all redoing the same thing. Now, they're really nice remakes. You know, Gobekli Tepe's Go get go get go tepli go back to is beautiful, right? Greek astronomy is you know the, the pictures are wonderful, but they're all remakes. They're all remakes of people that distant past. But I don't. I'm not saying that people made pyramids, and we're going to talk about that today. And I'm not going to say that they they made the exact same maps as the Greeks did. They had another way to do it, but it is the exact same constellations in the same order, and you can tell time and through space with these maps man bernie's coming out with both guns blaring look at that well see but here here is um and and thank you for that let's start with a general statement which is dogma by the way okay all right In, in the peers definition of dogma in that uh uh, cavemen were were wearing, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, wearing animal skins and running around with clubs, right? And yeah. and there's just we they didn't have a concept of of art. They didn't have that ability. And then you go and you look at these cave paintings, and I would argue that they are as deep and as beautiful as anything that anybody has ever done, ever, right? right? And so you cannot say that. And when you look at something like, or we're going to be talking about Iberia and, and Africa, but you can pick an, uh, any cave, ancient cave painting around the world and see a depth there. But when you look at uh, Lascaux and, and the idea that, 5,000 years of continuous occupation of that, 5,000 years, 
we can't even wrap our heads around uh, uh, these these kinds of uh, time periods, five thousand years, and you can see the expression, the emotion, and the depth of what is going on there to be preserved for us in the future. And I'm not wrong. The dogma that people have been fed over the years starts to become truth. And it's it's people like you that need to start to unravel for the world. Absolutely. Now, Jimmy, you just dated yourself a little bit because um, I didn't I haven't seen Let's Go because Let's Go was closed in 63, 64, the year before I was born. So, you've, you you know, I'm, you must be somewhere a little earlier than that time. But yeah, I'm, the about, dogma. I'm, about, I'm about 95. <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely the dogma. So where where does the dogma come from? I mean, that is like that's the big question. Why do people believe what they do? Well, it's actually about religion and it's about politics. So half the caves, Upper Valley Caves, are in Iberia, and the other half are in France. Early, um, early 1900s, Spain have a re- had a revolution. Franco took power, Generalissimo Franco, and he was aligned by the Catholic Church. Now, these were not kumbaya tam- tambourine Catholics. These were penance Catholics. You know, when was the last time you like, just worry here, Jimmy, when was the last time you did penance? Uh, mate, you know what? I was baptized Catholic. <laughs> I don't even know what that word means. So you got a long list to to atone for. Okay, we'll just leave that there. We'll put that on the side for now. A long list. Of, okay. So anyway, Franco takes Franco t- um, over overthrows a democratically elected government that w- alongside the um, Catholic Church. Okay, and f- until about 1970, that was the dogma. So there were three things in caves. There were images of people, there were images of animals, and there were geometric signs nobody could ever understand. And if you go into any of these Iberian caves today, that is exactly what they'll tell you. And they'll tell you that because it's a patriarchal society. They learn from their, their one professor going back in time to another. And there's, there's no there's no blasphemy because this is blasphemy because it ties into the catholic church and the catholic position and i'm not down on catholics because you know 1970s tambourines right you know kumbaya and bob dylan songs being sung the whole deal but spain never got out of that spain was in this this dark catholic um this dark uniform catholic cloaks late 1800s the Altamira cave was discovered, or uh, and um, about, and they thought it was a fraud because the Catholic Church decided that, and the archaeologists, the French archaeologists, of course, um, they said that nobody had the ability to do this in the deep upper Paleolithic. It had to be a fraud, and so they brought Picasso in about early 1900s, 1901, 1902, to ask the question. Picasso walked out and he said, "None of us could have done anything like this." But Picasso not only walked out with that statement, Picasso walked out with actual images that he placed onto his paintings. I mean, exactly onto his paintings. Um, one was Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, the two masks, which was said to be African masks. But he, the, the entirety of his work, so called cubism, modern art, no modernity to it, we, we have these upper Paleolithic images. And what Picasso said, he recognized, but he never said where he got them from, is that these people were animus. These people were animus. They saw themselves as animals, brothers, sisters, uncles, cousins, the whole thing. So if you saw a bull, that is of a fierce person. And in his art, he made the bull as Franco, because he was at odds with Franco. Interesting. So he, what he does is he takes these animistic, the, animistic themes. And if you look at animistic um, literature, mythology around the world. It's all about animals. Animals talk to each other. Then humans come and they give up their, their pelts and their, their um, meat, and flesh for the humans. But So we're looking at, when you're talking about religion and you're going back in time and saying, tens of thousands of years ago, we had these animist people that had the same traditions as we do, but as animals. That creates a little friction out there. And to this day, um, it's there. It's there in, in Spain. I've been there. I've walked through the caves and I've heard the guides and I've read the books and I've shook, shook things up. But anthropologists, archaeologists, mythologists, astronomers outside of Spain, this is, oh, my God, 
how come we didn't know this? How come we didn't connect that Picasso had lifted these cave, these images, these masks, and put them in his most famous artwork of all time? The rupture moment in modern art, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. That's where art comes from, modern art. Nobody knew that. But why didn't they know it? Well, first of all, Picasso was on the wrong side of Franco, which means he was the wrong side of the Catholic Church. Therefore, he was the wrong side of government nationalistic archaeology in Spain. So that's what this is all about. So what is the dogma? It truly is dogma. This is a religious this is a religious um, situation in Spain that's not in the rest of the world in the, in such a way. Okay, so history was driven by re the religion of the past of two centuries ago. And that's where the deep history has come from. So it's so it's, go on. No, well, but that's just it. And that's how dogma starts. Yeah. And the other the other part of it and and the word just the word dogma sometimes I I use it way too much, but it's because it's what drives the world. Right. Knowledge is based on dogma and it doesn't matter. You could put the, the religious side of it <laughs> because that's right there in front of us. But that goes with the history of Mesopotamia. It's dogma. The, the history of Egypt. It's dogma. You can go to Greek, Greek, which is modern. That's a modern society. Greece didn't rise until 600 B.C. Right. But. It's dogma that is fed down, and that is it. It is, and and once it gets started, it's very hard to back off of it and to get everybody cognitive dissonant. They've got the blinders on. They're driving down the road. They don't want to get off on an exit ramp. They just want to stay right there because it's safe. And I hate to say it. But that's just the way it is. And we are on a mission to help people understand, get past the facts, and then somehow get to the truth. Absolutely. Now, Jimmy, you realize there's some dancing with the devil tonight, right? The question is, who's flaming in red? Okay, we're going to have to, but that's the question we know by the end. So dogma, Mo around the world, most archaeology is funded by governments. Therefore, it becomes nationalistic archaeology, which we don't have so much in the United States, but everybody who's an archaeologist in Spain, professional archaeologist, is paid directly or indirectly by the government. You can go to Egypt, you can go to Turkey, anywhere in the world. And so what happens is the dog these dogmas get caught up in the uh, nationalism in the institution, and they become codified, literally codified in the laws, because if you say anything or you go digging around, you have just broken the law. Just Let's just give an example. Let's say, Jimmy, you are a the world's expert in ancient African languages and scripts. Okay. And as and in, in North Africa, the oldest language is the is um Tifana, I'm sorry, is a, a the Berber language, Amazil people people, and is it has a written language called Tifano. Okay, and Tifano is the oldest language possibly in the world that we know. Of. Okay. It's we find it in the Sahara and rock art dating back to tens of thousands of years. And let's say you're in Egypt and you're you see some some half a Tifano script at the bottom of a pyramid. And you look at that, you say, well, you know, that looks like Tiffano. Maybe I'll dig six inches under there to see what's there. Well, you just got thrown yourself in, in jail because you you marred, disrupted, not just the physical artifact, but also the, the nationality, the nationalism of Egyptology. You've just broken all the rules because the laws are designed that you're not supposed to be digging around on the on the edges of the pyramids. You're not in most places. You can't even take photographs. So in the caves of Spain, I cannot take photographs of the of the cave walls. But a lot of professional photographers have taken those photographs that I've I've been very fortunate to be able to use. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I got to work a way around that. But if you go around the world, we have this nationalist archaeology, anthropology. And this is not what all, ar all archaeologists and anthropologists are behind this. But the ones who get paid by the national governments definitely are. And we find this more outside the United States, and outside of Canada. Um, it's, it, it's really you know, Egypt, you know, freaking France, Spain, Turkey, uh, ma major, um, all over Africa. This is the way of the law. This is nationalistic archaeology. Now, when we talk, when I say nationalist archaeology around the world, 99.9% 99, 99 of archaeologists 
are not professional archaeologists. They graduate from college, they go do something else, they go work for you know something, right? But it's a very small percentage that actually become professionals and they become they fall in the trap. Because if they don't if they try to get out of the trap, they then um, are, you know, they lose their jobs. They lose their jobs. And what that's, it, let me let me jump in. It, that's exactly the problem. And I don't yeah. blame anybody here. Yeah. You've got to pay your mortgage. You've got to feed your kids. You're on a career path. Things are good. Things are secure. You don't want to ripple the water. And I, 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 I totally understand that. But there are those archaeologists and Egyptologists and, and, and anthropologists around the world that do dig six inches deeper. And they go, wait a minute. I've okay. been lied to. And that is happening more and more where it's, you know, it's just like, wait a minute, I can't, I can't conform anymore. And we're starting to see that shift. Do you feel the same shift going on? Absolutely. So I go to conferences, I go to scientific conferences in the humanities, astronomy, um, you know, geography, the whole thing. I've done about 25 conferences in the last four years, five years around the world, all the major conferences. And when I first started going to conferences, actually, so the first conference I went to, they didn't want to let me actually, I got in, the guy, I got kicked out. Okay. And sure. then someone said, someone up said, I want to hear this guy. I want to hear this guy. Um, and that person is now deceased. So fortunately, the timing worked out that he. So and he said, well, well, let's just let him do a poster. So I did a poster. And it actually worked out because it condensed a lot of information into a poster. And then the next conference I did, they said, OK, what's this guy do a paper? Well, you know, dozens of dozens of conferences and symposiums later, I have this great inventory. And when I go to a conference now, people clap when I finish, when I finish speaking, when they clap for nobody else. And so the world is the world changed people, people in these places where they're they're stuck in a hole by nationalistic archaeology or not really nationalism. It's not nationalist archaeology, it's nationalism. They want to hear what the other side says. So people in France, they want to hear what's, go, what's really going on in the Spanish caves and people in the UK and all these other places because they know they're not getting the story. When they right away, when they said, "Well, you guys didn't see the, the Picasso connection," or make actually, it's not that they didn't see the connection. People didn't make the connection. Is because politically, Picasso was you know he was on the out. Um, he was hiding out in France for a long time, and it, so people are saying, "Yes, we want to hear this guy." And I've done over a hundred podcasts um, around the world. I've done all these all these conferences, but I also hear of other people. I listen to other people. A lot of disruptive ideas, um, and they it takes it takes a movement. It takes people to cite your papers. It takes people to talk about your work. It take, takes people to keep inviting you to conferences and to symposiums and to teach at the universities and other places. So you have to build up a movement. What I don't do, what I've never done, is I've never said the hell with Jimmy Church. He's over there, and the hell with blank blank blank. He's over there. I'm not any anybody's side. I'm in the middle. Uh, I'm in the middle and I'm listening to both sides. I'm gathering information and I'm moving forwards, but I'm doing it from perspective of um, let's I'm getting people on, on board the ship, you know, over a hundred podcasts later, the ship's full. I was, you know, it's, it's pretty full anyway. <laughs> you know, maybe, you know, it's, it's not the big ships, you know, <laughs> the right. Ships. right, right. And, and, and let, let's, let's actually start to dive uh, deep here and let me, uh, I'm going to make an observation and end it with a question, but it, it'll, uh, b both of them will be quick, which is this. To take the time to paint or to create on a cave wall 30, 40,000 years ago took time. Not only did it take time, you had to create pigments, a, a transfer medium, a way to do that, that's a high level of intelligence, which would suggest you may have been taught from somebody before you, which pushes the dating back. But the other side of that is, if you are taking the time to create this, which takes time, instead of uh, killing something outside to feed your family, 
right? Because it was all about survival. Those mm-hmm. out there on the savanna in Africa that were thinking got eight, right? That's just mm-hmm. that's just a fact. Mm-hmm. So if if that is what we are dealing with, we have that element, and then we have the third thing. What is it that was so important? that they had to preserve it for us. They were observing mm-hmm. the heavens. Yeah. And, and in an astronomical sense, to do that then was extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Of the purest definition of that, right? And so when we look, and, and now when we start to pull this apart, what was so important to them to overcome and ignore surviving the night, right? Mm -hmm. To preserve for us for the future. What was it that was so important? The origin story. That's what it was. And it was it was preserved for us today. It is truly the origin story of humanity, where we came from and where we're going. And when I talk about the origin story, we're talking about the Big Bang. The Big Bang came from the cosmic egg. It didn't come from physics. It came from the story of the, from the, 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 the cosmic egg, which goes back to ancient Greece times. Whenever all the constellations, the, the whole cosmos was in an egg that exploded. Well, we actually have that cosmic egg story in Upper Pillar of the Cave Art because the Greeks ripped it off. At least, you know, they borrowed it and they didn't give credit for it. So it's the story of humanity. And we could, I'm going to walk into one cave for a moment. This cave is called the El Castillo Cave, and it's in northern Spain. I've been there. And you walk into the El Castillo Cave, you walk through some, some narrow areas, kind of slippery, lots of water on the floor. Even on this paved surface, it's slick. Okay, and you walk into this chamber called the get called the gallery of discs, and the gallery of discs is about ten meters long, so about thirty feet, and and you shine a light to it, and you see all these engraved lines. Now, what's very interesting about this? This naturally, you'd be just it's limestone. It just kind of be like mushy and hard, just hard mushy. That would be like. So what they did ten meters across is they engraved the entire surface, the, the entire surface. Okay. And there's this disc, red disc, about 100 or so, that run across from the right side to the left side. And on one end of the panel, if you study close enough, you can see all these um, Iberian European animals. You see a horse. You see an Iberian lynx. And on the other end of the panel, you see African animals. You see a giraffe. And there were no giraffes in Africa during the, this time period. No uh, giraffes in, in uh, Europe during this time period. And you see other you see other African animals. And in the middle, you see a whale, you see a dolphin, you see uh, a crab, um, and a monk seal. So you have a you have a body of water. So if we go from the north to the south, the body of water is a strait of Gibraltar. Simple. I mean, this isn't rocket science. It's simple, simple map making. And so all these animals, as you go from right to left, or north to south, or back again, they are animals that you would see on the terrestrial plane. So if you if you're in you're in if you jump out of an airplane and you land in in Madrid and you see a giraffe you're either in a zoo or you're not in Madrid it's one of the other okay and in North Africa there were giraffes at that time okay and so this so we have a we have map making and we have at, through mammals well we we can just go from from the from the north to the south again in the north we have a man we have a man that is actually Hercules he's the he is the constellation Hercules and that man overlaps with a horse. And that horse is Pegasus. And that, that horse overlaps with a, an eagle to give the wings of Pegasus. Okay. And the man also overlaps with the horse to become a centaur. Okay. And we go down this panel. We go through one constellation after the other. We go through Pisces in the center. Um, and then we have, you know, going, we have the bear on top, which is Ursa Major. Uh, we have the Leo, the lion, the, the lion. And the hero on this journey, actually, he, he fights with the lion. The only animal he fights with is the lion. And he, so he becomes Hercules. The hero is Hercules, is the origin story of Hercules. But as he travels through the night sky, we see Hercules as a constellation. We see Orion as a constellation, as the actual figure constellation. We see Perseus as a constellation. He's swimming. But it's all the same hero on his journey. So they didn't see it as they, they didn't. So in, in Greek mythology, you have the Hercules does one story, Orion does another. And but that's not how the, the, the Pelthic story was. It was one hero on his journey through the seasons, through the night sky. And as he goes through these seasons, through the night sky, he meets animals wherever he goes. And he overlaps with those animals who give him strength. They teach him how to be successful in the, the real world. Now, all those animals, except for the lion, is female. They're all, he fights the lion, but all the others that help him are female. And by the end of his journey, 
other journey, he gets back to the north again, and he sees he becomes the complete um, mix of the male and female. Okay, so we're not talking about sex. We're not. We're talking about this is a psychological transformation. So he he sees the the, the total of the world. But remember that animus thought the animals were the brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, all that sort of stuff. So he has incorporated not just the, he has incorporated the terrestrial cosmos. He has, he has incorporated the, the constellation cosmos in the underworld to complete the package. So he's integrated everything together. Now, this is not unique to upper people. We find this among Native Americans. We find... Let me jump in. Let me, okay. Yeah. That that panel that you're referring to, uh, let's not uh, let's not just blow past it because yeah, yeah, it's, sure. it's extraordinary. extraordinary. Number one, number it, is, I'm say, it is the most important artifact in the world. It, in the world, far it's, Yeah, it's crazy. Hmm. But when you first see it, right? Okay, the gallery. The, it's just spots on a wall. Right. It's just <laughs> animal. it's it's just prehistoric man goofing around, right? Yeah. Painting out painting. And then you you have to stop and look. Oh, wait, wait a minute. This is celestial. Now, mm-hmm. if 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 the, the representation it, some I'm just gonna be direct here. Somebody's go, oh yeah, that's a horse. Isn't that cute? Wow, mm. they could they, they knew how to paint a horse mm. to tie uh, to actually see what you're seeing, which is constellations. Mm. That means um, this painting that predated modern man. I'm just going with air quotes sure. for the for the dog mist out there, right? Sure. That means that prehistoric man is going out and observing the cosmos, observing the seasons, observing a timetable. That takes a long time to cycle through. They are seeing the same images, you know, looking at Pegasus, right? Looking at Leo and seeing that and turning around and inserting it into the timeline. That is high intelligence. And that really freaks me out. And to, to go to Gobekli Tepe or the modern Zodiac mm-hmm. and the astrologers of the world to say these things, it was going on 35,000 years ago. The ancients were seeing the same thing over a huge length of time to get it accurate on this cave wall. Right? And that, yeah. that, 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 it's crazy town. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. So what the if what they also saw was the animals in season. So they didn't just show an animal; they'd show like a an eagle at a certain age. And the eagle is is a, a kilo, a kilo of the constellation, and that's in mid June. Well, if someone saw that same that same panel ten years later, they would recognize that a kilo was out of season, and that somehow time had been different. That they didn't know what it was. But they would have realized that somehow time was different. There was an earlier time. There was an earlier epic. There was an earlier stage of mankind that we weren't. This is not the time we have now. Um, but we could look back in time. And ultimately, that's probably how procession came about there. Or Parker's the concept of procession is they realized that there were images from earlier time that showed constellations in different seasons. Therefore, there was a different time. There was a different age. Okay, now, different age. okay that, that, that's a really good point. Actually, I was going to touch upon that a few minutes ago. Is that you have to accurately, and I don't know how they did it, right? Mm-hmm. But I imagine something like this: a stick in the ground with a shadow, and then you tell your son, "Okay, in thirty years, you're going to take over my job, and this is what's going on, right? You're going to observe, you're going to look at this, and then you're going to do another one and another one, and and that's where we are at now. In about twenty thousand years, we're going to get the full <laughs> cycle of the procession, but, but but that's this is how." You know, you know what I mean. This kind of tradition, yeah. it wasn't put together with a telescope over a weekend. 
This took huge amounts of time where the tradition was handed down and taught to the next generation. And there isn't another way to look at it, is there? There isn't, no. And the the the, the year is somewhere around 320,000 years ago. Yeah. In, nor- in western North Africa, at a place called Jebel Air Hood. And for a long time, people thought that the oldest modern humans came from South East Africa 20, 240,000 years ago. But they were, there were bones that they had at Jebra Hood in West North Africa, Morocco, that were not correctly dated until about five or six years ago. And it just exploded 320,000 years ago. It was absolutely amazing. And so rewrote the entire history of mankind when nobody thought it could be that way. So I would say that the starting point was 320,000, around 320,000 years ago in the West North Africa, a place called Jebel Erhud. I, and Jebel means mountain Erhud is, is the place itself. And that's, now this is where it gets, this is where it gets, I'm going to take you to another level of crazy, right? I mean, we're on the level of crazy. Um, we're dancing with the devil right now. There's a, there's a mountain in West North Africa called um, uh, Jebel Tobokal. Jebel Tobokal was the tallest mountain in, in North Africa. The Greeks had a name for it. They called it Atlas. You want to know the get, take one guess at what the what the what the Greeks called the people that lived there? Atlanteans. You got it. At, the Atlanteans, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And that's and before before. So bef- this is from Herodotus, and who was before who was before Plato. And before Plato, for Herodotus, there was the the Phoenician Sanchinatho, and he said that a Greek. I'm sorry, he said that a Phoenician a Phoenician went to this mountain and he founded astronomy. Okay, so if you look at um, all these images that I'm talking about, they're actually paradoia. They start. They don't start in the night sky. Not at all. They start in paradoia on the terrestrial plane. So if you look at the face of Jebel Tobacal, you see all this paradoia. Well, actually, if you know what to look for, you see you see an elephant. You see the, the ear of an elephant, and you see the head of the elephant. And the climbing route up Jebel Tobacal is actually over the head and up the ear. It's a thing. And um, and then you know, at the top, you see this kind of reptile kind of splayed out in paradoia. And that reptile became Draco in on the on the Gower of Death, so the constellation Draco. And of course, of course, Hercules climbs Atlas. Remember that story, right? He climbs Atlas. And when he climbs Atlas, uh, the Titan Atlas is already turned to stone because in a previous myth, Perseus carries up the head of Medusa and she turns all the animals and the, and the Titan to stone through her gaze. And so they had this, this animist way of looking at it to explain how it came to be. Well, all of those animals on the gallery of discs are founded in terrestrial paradoia. Okay. And so what they saw was sort of animals on top of animals. So they didn't actually create the constellations in, in such a way that they looked at, they saw this paradoia and they say, well, we're going to put that star there for the tail or that one there for the eye. And that's how it made this it made it simple. Because if you try to overlap all these animals on the gallery of discs as constellations, it's, it's impossible. But they had the source. So they literally copied it so that the Iber- in ancient Iberia, up people, they copied it from Western North Africa. They had the source. Uh, Rock of Gibraltar is another series where they, there's a bunch of animals. Um, there's a, there's a we find both the the um, a whale and a dolphin going. One goes north, the other one goes south, and that becomes Pisces for the for the. So we can go through one af, one animal after another, and then there's a third site. There's a third site that I didn't know until last year, and it really stumped me. I mean, it's like stump. When I when I was working on this project, started this about um, 2014. I had a guide, I had a guide of sorts. His name is George Shower. George Shower is the foremost wildlife biologist in in the world. He's the man. He's the man. I met him when I was I was in my early uh, early th- early twenties in Beijing. I've been places, um, and George and me. I remember him. And I contradicted him when I felt I saw this pit on the gallery of discs. I saw it looked like a lion, um, and I also saw that looks like an elephant. But the lion had a mane, and, and at that time, in, in a pair with cave art, there was no lions with manes because we don't know. And the, the elephant was clearly not a, um, a an Iberian elephant because they didn't have a humped head and had a flat head like an African elephant. So George and I we worked together, and you know if he helped me out. A year and a half later, um, we kind of wrapped up dozens of animals on a few different panels. But one of the animals that w- was most important and that totally, ger- to- totally changed George's mind said, this is what it is, this is north, this is south, and that's Africa, was the giraffe. Now, this is what George said. He said, it's a Maasai giraffe. Maasai giraffes are in South Africa. 
South yeah. Africa. Okay. What, okay. okay. How, what, what stuck out for him to go right there? The head and the horns. The head and the horns. He said, this is clearly a Maasai giraffe. And so what we've, we knew, there, there's still giraffes in North Africa. You, think, you know, people hunt them in the Sahara. And so we mm-hmm. said, well, maybe this Maasai giraffe wandered north. But something happened last summer. Something came out in the news at, a, at a, the Rising Star Caves, the Cave of Bones. It was all over Netflix. Mm-hmm. And I looked at that thing and I said, oh, my God, it's a match. And it was the, the, the piece of the puzzle fit right together. And there was a Maasai giraffe. And I was like, whoa, there's a Maasai giraffe. And then what I do is I saw the other animals in the same order that we see them both on the Gower Disc and another panel in, near Gibraltar. And so what we connect, what I connected, we already worked out this West North Africa and the Siberian p- picture. But we didn't know what that, where that giraffe came from. And once we saw the, the, this Holman, Holman the Letty, but not really, um, this it, these images in the Rising Star Cave, it connected the dots to put the whole picture together that the range of these people were from the Iberian Peninsula to South Africa, at a minimum, at a minimum. Now, people will say, well, that's an awful long way to go. Well, Saharan Tuareg, the people, you know, the, the blue people who, want, who sort of wander out of the Sahara, they travel over a thousand miles a year on foot, and they stop along the way and have campus, campus. So to walk to walk from the Iberian Peninsula to South Africa isn't that far. I mean, for you and I, you know, we're we're you know, we probably just need a few days in the gym. Maybe we can do it, but it's not that far. So the the scope of people, or their range of people, was from the Iberian Peninsula to South Africa. Now, what did Plato say about the Atlantes? What did he say that their range was? He said the whole of Africa. He said the whole of Africa. That's what he said. Okay. Yes, he did. So where did so where did where did where did Plato get that from? Well, he got it from Egypt. He got it from the the priests. Well, when he was in Egypt at the same time, there was an astronomer named Eudoxus. He was Greek, and it was Eudoxus that brought the Greek constellation, the, the these constellations from Egypt to Greece that comp- that made the record. So all these constellations that we're talking about here, and many more of the record. They came from Egypt, they came through Eudoxus, and we know that's when they entered the record. And then they were, sub- they were supplemented with Mesopotamian constellations and some other constellations the ancient Greeks had. So, Plato was right, but Plato was wrong. Plato didn't understand the big picture. He said the whole of Africa, what the heck does that mean? So people think that's Libya, right? think it's Libya. But Eudoxus brought back the science, he brought back the astronomy, and he gave he left off this record that we can compare with the upper with, with the upper pillar record to see what constellations were brought over where and when. And the constellations were not just what they saw in northern Spain, not just what they saw in, in, in Iberia, uh, 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 Strait of Gibraltar, or what they saw at Jebel Tobacal in Morocco. There were also constellations that they saw in South Africa. And at that time, it's the Ice Age. We have the, the furthest range in both directions. There was no place else to go. Okay. Now, this is where I ask the obvious question. Walking is one thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. I get that. I understand that. But to have so many cultures, and in 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 many cases, we have to uh, get water in between. Mm-hmm. So now we're talking about something transoceanic. But uh, if you, that's north to south, on, right? Yeah. Hold, on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. But <laughs> you can't answer the question before I ask it. <laughs> Is this the consistency of something like Gobekli Tepe? which has constellations. You have the modern Zodiac in, say, Dendera, right? Mm-hmm. You've got what's going on in Iberia, but you also mm-hmm. have what's going on in Australia, in Polynesia. You mm-hmm. have South Africa. You have a consistent, uh, eventually, what turns into the Zodiac that we know today. But the ancients were seeing the same thing. Now, the communication via walking is one thing, but it was a global identification. So how do we explain that? Or was there one central teacher body of knowledge that Mm -hmm. was navigating the world and sharing astrology and astronomy and what the constellations were represented by? 
good question. Okay. So starting from, I don't think they walked either. Okay. <laughs> but I think they took, because we talked about the constellations. These constellations are really from north to south. Okay. North to south. And so I believe they took canoes or something along the shoreline. Now you asked the question about going. So then the question is going, we're going to put Gobekli Tepe on the side because that's something different. Okay. Okay. So rock art emerges or cave art emerges for the first time that we have a record of is about 45,000 years ago in Indonesia. And then about 40,000 years ago emerges in Europe. Okay. So it was in Indonesia first. It's quite, so the, rock, the cave art emerge in Africa, then go east and north, okay, possibly. Um, so the, the central point was not in, in Iberian Peninsula, was a central point in Indonesia. I don't know, okay, because there's not that much of it, and it's not it's not of the same, I'm going to say the quality as we find in, in, in South Africa or we find in Iberian Peninsula. So this is what probably happened is people did leave – Western North Africa. That's what I'm going with. Okay. They, and they went in all different directions. Okay. Um, they didn't, I don't think those people got to Australia. Okay. But this is what happened. As people migrate to new areas and settle down, they they found new constellations, they found new animals, they found new environments, new parabolia to, to build on. And they created their own little like, cultures that was built on the original culture. And then they left and went someplace else and they merged with other people. And so by the time, you, so the people in Australia ultimately got what everybody had in Australia. I'm sorry, everybody had in, in Iberian Peninsula and Africa, but they had created their own, their own night sky. Um, they'd create their own environment that made sense for them. Because as we talked about these animals, we said these are Iberian animals, these are African animals, these are animals that swim across back and forth on the Strait of Gibraltar. These are animals that are unique to their environments. So when so people traveled to other places, they had to incorporate the new animals because they didn't know what a giraffe was. <laughs> they didn't know. Well, so, but, it, right, but you know what complicates things? And I don't want to, yeah. uh, because you're absolutely spot on. But here's where it gets, uh, this is where I stop for a second and go, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Australia is in the Southern Hemisphere. They've got a different sky. They're, they're looking at something completely different than anybody yes. else on the planet. And yes. yet the similarities are the same thing. And the ability to understand, understand astronomy and time and, and procession we're all there from the southern sky looking out into the southern hemisphere, which is different than Mesopotamia. That's different than South Africa, and it's different than Egypt, and it's certainly different than the United Kingdom, and it's certainly different from the Baltic Sea, right? Or yeah. Siberia or North America. And I, it seems to me that maybe the migration's there. But I think somebody was also coming to them. I agree with that too. People were moving around. There was this was we had cultural exchange from South Africa to the Iberian Peninsula, ongoing cultural exchange. Now we we talked about the the giraffe, the Maasai giraffe. I found the constellation of the Maasai giraffe, and I, it just told. I didn't realize it until I saw the the Homo naledi stuff, which isn't Homo naledi. It's the Southern Cross, and indigenous peoples in South Africa are still using the giraffe for the Southern Cross. And so, when I I give these, these presentations to astronomy groups, you know, professional astronomers, and I go through all these Greek constellations, and I leave the space. I've always left out the giraffe because I didn't know what constellation it was, and the giraffe is further south than Orion. I'm uh, going south, and so th when, I, when I when I started, I, then I started looking. What is what's there? And the Southern Cross is the crossing neck of the mother giraffe and her juvenile. That's what we see in the image. We just don't see a mother giraffe. We see the crossing neck of the mother giraffe and her juvenile, and that creates the southern. So the Southern Cross, as the constellation. Uh, as the constellation of the giraffe goes back to at least 34,000 years ago, probably goes back to 320,000 years ago. Okay. Um, so that is the, so what, what's important about that's a North to South constellation. What I'm not seeing is any East to West constellations. I'm only seeing North to South and I'm not seeing the constellations that there's all kinds of um, in Australia, they have all kinds of other constellations and I'm not talking indigenous ones. I'm talk not talking about the, the white man's, you know, Captain Cook sort of stuff. Um, I don't see them. 
You know, I'm, I'm only seeing animals that are indigenous from a straight line from the Iberian Peninsula down to South Africa. I'm not seeing kangaroos. Okay. It's so, and, but I'm not saying, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing giraffes in Australian constellations either. Um, but we have this, this link that it's amazing. This, this whole this BS, totally BS homo Luddy project uh, for the engravings turned into one of the biggest discoveries that they didn't even know was in front of them um, for the, the connection between the North and South and the upper Paleolithic. And they have the same animals in the same order that overlaps with the Iberian ones. And they're all constellations. They're all constellations that we can still identify today because the Greeks received them, the Greek Eudoxus received them through the priests in Egypt at the time of Plato. When was then was the opening of Greece to the world following the, the conquest of Alexander the Great. Now, so was, uh, uh, we, um, uh, oh, really? Oh, there is a new, I, I spent 30 seconds on this. There's a <laughs> new uh, docu-series about Alexander. Ah, where did I see it? Might be Netflix. I'm not too sure. I saw it a couple of weeks ago. Friggin' amazing. And if you haven't seen it, go and check it out. The documentary, Alexander the Great, go do a search. It's it's a recent release. Really good. Um, but, Okay. Staying on this, the uh, the idea of looking to the sky and preserving it and and locking it down mm. would suggest that there was a deep understanding of you have to throw in mathematics, you have to throw mm, in. I remember that they started from the paradoy on the mountain. But they're also counting. They're counting. You, you have to be able to understand well, when yeah, they the can count. Yeah, they can obviously count. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And yeah, and yeah, when <laughs> and when we are talking about huge chunks of time, millennia on millennia on millennia mm. on millennia, yeah. that it wasn't ten fingers. You know, oh, we can count to twenty because we have ten toes. It was much more complex than that. So there was a, a deep understanding of mathematics, uh, you know, 30, 40,000 years ago, uh, right, you know, the pre-Ice Age. And so this is what I think they did. So they they had the constellations in the night sky, they had the constellations in the Paradoia, and they had the representation of those constellations as animals on the terrestrial plane. So if they walk north or south, they see, you know, the different animals. And they also they also knew because the map the constellation map takes them north to south and it takes them to each paradoia spot and so they can reinforce reinforce the narrative now i would say going back to your first question your first first question was why did they do this why did they why did they preserve this and truly for us today because it's the origin story it's not just the or their origin story of hunter gatherers it's the origin story of mankind it takes us back three hundred twenty thousand years ago to west north africa the jebel air hood where we now know we have the oldest the, the oldest um documented recorded homo sapiens it's the origin story they were just as interested in back then as we are today and so they were the origin this was a pilgrimage it was an origin story pilgrimage to go back and forth back and forth between west between the iberian peninsula north west north africa and south africa back and forth these people knew each other. i'm like i'm gonna tell you i'm not gonna say they're brothers or sisters these people were connected because the artistic styles are just too close. This is impossible. And there are animals in the in the in the home in the Rising Star Cave, South Africa images that did that have haven't existed in South Africa since forever. For example, bears. There's there's never been any. I mean, like for hundreds of thousands, of years, there are no bears in South Africa. The bears were in West North Africa. They're called. Um, the Atlas map, the Atlas bears, and we find lots of bears in the Bayern Peninsula. And so we have the bears. We have the bears. We have the giraffes in one place where they, they don't exist, and we have bears and, and other animals in another place that don't exist. There's also horses depicted in South Africa, and they're not zebras and they're not whatever people can come up with. They're horses. There were no horses in South Africa. There were no horses in Africa um, at that time period. So we have animals in the wrong place. They knew, These people knew each other. They had cultural exchange. And 
And I would say that they weren't the same artists because I've studied that I've you know I spent years on this studying the techniques, but these artists were somehow connected within generations. So they weren't hundreds of hundreds of years, thousands of years, or that, that they were not that far apart. These were connected within generations that they had they they could replicate the artistic styles. By the way, there's probably more of these. There's probably lots more of this that people haven't found. Well, yeah, you see it everywhere. And there are times, I'm not making this up, Bernie, because I look at this. I talk about this probably once or twice a week on the show. I've been doing it for a decade. Cave art blows my mind. Petroglyphs mm -hmm. blow my mind. Hieroglyphs, right? Mm -hmm. well, look at that. And, and you start to see the same thing over and over again. And there are times when I'm looking at cave art and I don't even know what country I'm looking at. Because <laughs> the right? The yeah. similarity is, is right there. Yeah. Now it would suggest to me, I, I, I go, I go to the dark side immediately. I, I dance with the devil. It seems that somebody is teaching that's it feels to me like somebody is teaching. I don't think there are any original thoughts. I'm going to we're going to go to a break. I'm going to share this with you. I think that the origin story is spot on. The problem with the, the that with that that conflicts with the dogma is the dogma says, "No, man." They're painting what they see in nature. Well, well, wait a minute. There is no double helix in nature. Show me a double helix somewhere, right? Show me these right angles. Show me the, 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 the and, and when you look at that, show me where this exists in nature. And when you start to get into celestial stuff, like the Castile Cave, by the way, it doesn't exist in nature. Oh, yeah, the horse does. But the rest of it, the mathematical calendar, right, mm -hmm. right, right there in front of you, that doesn't exist in nature. So you can't say that. It conflicts. And so I'm, I'm in a cave here in North America. I'm with some friends. We find this cave. It's at night, by the way. And we go up, and this is what we see. Now, and everybody was at, and we saw all these petroglyphs, and I'm trying to figure it out. And and I said to the group, I didn't know uh, anything until much later, there's a story here. They're telling us mm -hmm. something. Now, mm -hmm. let's just figure this out. Now, there's 700 petroglyphs, by the way, right, in this uh, and and we're looking at all of this together anyway. So we we get up into this cave, high up on the cave wall. It's claustrophobic, by the way. And high up on the cave wall, I've got it on video. I can show you the pictures. Is this about thirty feet up? I don't even know how they got up that high to carve this. Is a dude, a stick figure, standing on water. Okay, so you see the water, and it's about it's about yay big, right? Maybe mm -hmm. three feet by three feet. He's standing mm -hmm. on water with his arms extended, and in one hand is a ball. He's holding up a circle. Mm -hmm. On the other hand is a cross, just a simple cross. Mm -hmm. And he's standing on this boat on water, holding out. And it's like, okay. What are they saying here? Now, you have to really look at that. Now, you can go in any, there's a lot going on in something. I can so offer something. Cool. I can offer saying, Jesus Christ, Jimmy, you need to go to penance. <laughs> I'm waiting for the lightning bolts, right? But but it, it, it's extraordinary. And nobody knows who did these petroglyphs. Okay, that that's it. Uh, it's in the Mojave Desert, but the Mojave Indians say not not they, they were here when we got here. So nobody really knows. But there's an origin story there. Yeah, a, a boat on water in the middle of the desert mm -hmm. with a guy, you know, holding up. It's 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 bizarre. But that's for uh, preserving, right? It's a library. 
preserving well, something for us for the future, trying to tell us something. On the dark side of the moon, right? In five minutes. We're going to hit Gobekli Tepe. Let's talk about it. Let's do it. This is Fade to Black. Excuse me, I'm drinking coffee. Our guest tonight, Bernie J. Taylor. We are doing all of that and much more tonight on Fade to Black. Mythology, cave art, origins, astronomy, astrology, all of that when we come back right after this short break. Stay with us. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, get your alerts, and access to over 2,000 videos. Click that subscribe button right now. My job is not to preach. My job is to take you on this journey. In a state of passion, nothing negative can happen. That it's the moons of those planets that would have life. Sometimes I see, you know, these energies also in your field. It is our passion and our pleasure. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and get the Fade to Black official podcast. 2,000 episodes, all of them commercial free for just $2 a month. This is Jimmy Church. Please visit and explore Egypt this October 3rd through the 14th, 2024 with Billy, Elizabeth, myself, and very special guest, Matt LaCroix. It's simple to do. Just go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com and click on Upcoming Tours or click on the link below. We'll see you there. Watch Into the Vortex on Gaia TV. It's fade to black for the screen. Simple to do. Go to Gaia.com, search Jimmy Church, or click on the link below. Follow Fade to Black on Twitter at J Church Radio. Get all of the show updates every single day. It's it, it's now called X, but who cares? How you doing? Jimmy Church here. Special announcement. Get your Fade to Black t-shirts. That's right. Help support the show. Help support everything that we do over here. We've got two t-shirts. We've got two ways to get them. And right now, if you get a Game Changer membership for a limited time, you will get Fade to Black Blend Coffee with your Game Changer membership. That's right. We have two t-shirts. We have the original, the classic Fade to Black t-shirt. You know you want one. Post a picture. Send it to us. We'll put it in our Fade to Black gallery. And we've got the new official Fade to Black t-shirt drawn by Michael Oming. Two t-shirts, two ways to get them. Get yours today. Everything is in stock. Everything gets autographed. 
Everything includes shipping, and you're going to get a tracking number. And with the Game Changer membership, you get an email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads of the show. Those are uploaded every single night after the show to the website. So don't delay. Get your Fade to Black t-shirt today. Go Backley Tappy. Go to jimmychurchradio.com and become a fade or not. Get a membership. That's right. Everything is commercial free. You have access to downloads and you get to call yourself a fade or not. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Bernie Taylor is with us. He's got the J in there for a good reason. There are a lot of Bernie Taylors running around out there. You've got to separate yourself from those other Bernie Taylors. And tonight, so we're talking about mythology, cave art, astronomy, astrology, and and how it ties into everything with us today. Fascinating conversation. I just came off of the Conscious Life Expo, and one of the subjects, uh, Andrew Collins was there, one of my favorite people on this planet, and we had long discussions, panels uh, about that centered around Go Backley Tepe, one of my favorite things. Now, here's here's the deal. It's Bernie, the magic of Go Backley Tepe is well, first off, it cannot be measured. That's the first thing. Mm-hmm. But the sure. second thing is it's an enigma. It wasn't supposed to exist. Mm. The dog, the dogma, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Is dogma. that yeah, 3000 BC, nothing before, don't talk to us. Everything is at 3000 BC. You have Giza, you have Mesopotamia, language, the arts, astronomy, engineering, laws, civilization, communal living, cities, writing. Everything happened at 3000 BC. If anything else goes down, let us know. Well, boom, go back to Tepe. And it predates by 7,000 years, right? Or older, right? And that's part of the magic of Gobekli Tepe, but it was a gift to the dogma, right? <laughs> it just pushes everything. It just messes up everything. But here's the thing, uh, uh, one of the many things about Gobekli Tepe, but that, we have 3D relief art. What? That wasn't supposed to exist, right? Right. Clearly, it's there. And it was deliberately buried and preserved. It was ju- it's just magic. But it would suggest there are animals there that weren't supposed to exist in that area. Mm-hmm. And on, on Pillar 43 and others, I would suggest constellations now when you say oh well, hold on it's a separate subject pump the brakes let's get into this you have my full attention so what are we seeing with gobekli tepe absolutely well it's what happens with gobekli tepe is a continuance of knowledge Twelve thousand years ago cave art ends in europe just zip all that art okay at that time, it is an explosion in the Sahara, and we do have a genetic back migration into West North Africa 12,000 years ago. Then now the, the other place that we see big art is Gobekli Tepe. Okay? There's a theme in upper, in upper Philly cave art that we have the, 
the man that emerges with the bird okay it it's a some people would say shamanic i say it's animistic it's the man becomes one with the bird it's his aunt his uncle his grandmother whatever the story is the man merges with the bird and that beca that becomes the constellation hercules and that in, the, in that north 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 end of the sky that's important north end of the spot sky so let's go to the the vulture stone at gobekli tepe we're going to start off that you know you know is that big beak and that round head right the round head Google, Google go vultures anywhere in the world. There is no vulture with a round head. Okay. And also the, 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 the wings on that vulture are just way too short for a vulture. And then it has that, that V collar, just like my shirt, just my shirt has a V collar. Just like all the human figurines at Gobekli Tepe, they had that V collar. Okay. So the red, the round head is not of a vulture. It's of a human. And what we're looking at is a, an alienoid, a human figure, a man, and I would say that's a child, it's the size of the head, has put, has, has a vulture, has a raptor, possibly vulture beak, and is wearing the wings of a vulture. Okay. So it is, it becomes this, this figure, this spiritual leader figure who, mer who merges into the bird to go on his journey. And we find this over and over and over again in our pillow cave art. The only difference is, is that we don't see that character, Gobekli Go Go Tepe, riding a horse. It's the only difference, emerging to the Pegasus. Okay. So what I would say, and it's also that, that, that bird, I'm going to call it a bird man, is also northerly facing. And the same as the constellation Hercules, and as we find in Upper Pillar of the Cave Art. Okay. So as we go down from there, we have this, we have a scorpion. On Upper Pillar of the Cave Art, we have a, um, a crab. Okay. A crab. And so we have a crab and a scorpion. To, to, you, we might taxonomically think they're different animals, but for people tens of thousands of years ago, it's the same. It's roughly the same animal. Okay. So you do. So that becomes the constellation Scorpius. Okay, and so you have you have the Hercules overlaps with the bird Achaea, Achaea, and then we have the Scorpius. Okay, we have that same alignment northerly facing into on Gobekli Tepe. So where's the connection? Where, I mean, like besides actually iconography, these are the same things. What's the connection? How can we actually prove this thing? Well, there's the people in western in, in northwest northeastern Spain are the Basque, and the Basque have been there since time memorial. And the Basque are the people of Guernica who were bombed by. Remember Franco? Okay, going back to that story, Franco. Okay, Franco bombs the Basque, um, and the Basque people are believed. Well, the Basque will say that they have a unique language; nobody else in the world has it, and it is for certain not connected to any of the Indo-European languages. That's for not that. true. That no, no. I think. Okay, our, wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay. Okay, I was just, European. they've got Armenian words. In oh, that's language. where I was going. That's where I was going. How'd you know that? I am Jimmy Church. Now you're Jimmy. Okay, it's, it's Armenian. So, but Indo-European, yeah, Armenian is not Indo-European. Okay, right. I mean, it's not. It isn't. It isn't. Okay, it isn't. Okay, so you know that. Okay, so you're right. So Armenian, they're Armenian. And so the Basque have always said, well, you got to prove this with the archaeology. Well, 12,000 years ago, people left the Iberian Peninsula, including the Basque. They went, they went south to Africa, and they went, they went east to Turkey, about as far as they could go. And they brought their art with them. And we see these reliefs on, on limestone pillars at Gopalakli Tepe. Well, up to a cave art is full of these reliefs. And every one of those caves, as far as I know, everyone I've seen, they're limestone caves. They use the same substrate with the same characters, and they took it to Gobekli Tepe and other places. We this there's probably more of those out there. So just as just as Gobekli Go, Go, Go Tepe was buried, and just like the Rising Star Cave in South Africa was just the the graves were just realized within the la last year, there's probably more of these all over the place that we just haven't seen, or we or they've been buried nationalistically for different reasons okay Could, usually found in a religion so so the connection between the basque and the armenian is language there's there's one of the mountains one of the paradoli mountains i worked on in northern spain is called chindoki chindoki doki means place um and chin has absolutely no meaning in basque it's just it's just chin well chin does have a meaning in armenian it means bad so it means a bad place Okay. Right. And then this 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 Chindoki is a is a paradoia 
uh, it's a paradoid elephant. Okay, that's what it is. It's really cool. You can look at my images. It's, it's pretty cool. And we find this this chindoki replicated multiple times in different uphill of the cave from 12 to about 22,000 years ago. Okay, so we find it over and over and over again, and it actually becomes the constellation Taurus. If you, at the time of year as depicted in the caves in that season, if you got up before dawn and you saw, looked in that direction at Chindoki, you would see the constellation Taurus setting into the day, effectively. Okay, and we can find the same concept over and over again with different animals and uphill at cave art. Well, so what we do have is we have chindoki with chin, which is a or meaning word, and we have chin, which is a, uh, uh, um, it's still there. Okay. So the Armenians have been arguing, as you know, for decades, and this is, go, this is for over 100 years, they made this recognition, the Basque say, no, 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 where's the archaeological evidence? Gobekli Tepe is the archaeological evidence that connects the two. 12,000 years ago, they, people went, the people went east, and then 8,000 years ago, People came back again. People came during the, the agriculture migration, came back into, well, came into Spain, France. So we have, you have two different migrations. You have a migration 12,000 years ago, and you have a back migration 8,000 years ago that brought agriculture. So yes, Gobekli Tepe is the signature of Upper Pele, the cave art. In fact, stylistically, there's... Um, Upper the, the the Iberian. Let's go. You you said that you saw. You can't tell the difference between the caves, uh, cave art, um, because most of it's actually Franco Iberian cave cave um, art within you know three hundred miles of each other. Okay, that's why it kind of looks the same. We have the same style with the reliefs in on Gobekli Tepe. The difference is Gobekli Tepe. It's an earthquake zone. You ca caves aren't going to last very long. And so people built the substructure of the cave. They dug it out. They had the pillars and they put something on top of it. So some people drop down into the chambers to have their, um, their, uh, should I say the, the apprentice journey, the, the religious experience, how to pass on the knowledge, the origin story to the next people. And they pass on that knowledge story of the man that merges with the eagle that's next to the crab. That crab, that man, and that and that bird is in Paradoia at the Rock of Gibraltar. The story originates at the Iberian Peninsula. At okay. the Rock of Gibraltar. Let me um There's I've, a blow, got, right? I, I've got like 10 thoughts to to get in here. The first one is um is that the sun or the moon or another planet? On the vulture stone, no idea, no idea, no idea. Yeah. So what they did was they so that also the birds to if you're looking at it to the bottom right look like geese or something like that, not cranes. People picked up as people traveled, they picked up new animals to put into their constellations. So those that those geese, crane, whatever they are, do not which are water birds, by the way, they do not exist in the upper pillar of the cave art. We have, but we do have the man that merges with the bird that, and under him is the scorpion, the crab that we find in the Iberian record. And we find in Paradoia at the Rock of Gibraltar. So we, ha we have a time and place. But, there, but there's some intention here. And I've, I've, uh, intention, not attention. Sure. There's intention with the way that the, the, because either that's the sun or the moon, maybe it's the earth. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but but it's being held up by the vulture. I mean, it's it's there with intention, and I'm always <laughs> okay. So, but, so it, it's, it's this is what I that propeller cave art. We find that the Hercules at the end of his journey, he holds an egg. He holds an egg. Okay, that egg is stolen in, in the in the gallery of discs is stolen from a crocodile, which becomes a consideration. Draco. And the Greeks picked up that story and they said that he was stealing the golden apple from at, at Atlas from under the, the the monster crocodile Draco. So it's he, he carries the same symbol in our pillow cave art as an egg. So is that an egg in Gobekli Tepe or symbolism of something like that concept? Because remember, it's the cosmic egg. It's where the everything comes from. Everything explodes from that cosmic egg. That is that is the origin story. The origin well, story is uh, okay, right. okay. Okay, now I'm going to take it one step further. Sure. Okay, uh, there's two points I need to make. Sure. 
and you're going to address them both, but I want to ask them at the same time. Above the Vulture is, one, in my opinion, one of the craziest things on planet Earth, and that is the three purses. Sure. So those three handbags are clearly depicted there intentionally. Mm -hmm. And mm-hmm. if we are dealing with an origin story, and mm-hmm. it's ascending right from north to south, top to bottom, sure. however you want to put it, sure. it it it's there in order. And that so you have the purses above, which is my point. Sure. Second, the vulture is holding yeah. a freaking planet or something, yeah, right? I'm good with and that. Then, and then you have a, a scorpion below. So you've got the order of things in an yes. origin story. That purse is on every continent in the world. It's part of somebody's mythology that has been depicted in in paintings, cave art, sculpture, in stories, in mythology, Sumerian, ancient Mesopotamia. You have the Anunnaki version of this, but it goes all the way over to North, Central, and South America, too, as well. Very interesting that this shows up boop, out of the blue at Gobekli Tepe of 12,000 years ago from today. Now, Here's the second part. I want you to address that because what is in those purses? Is that the origin story? Is it DNA? Is it knowledge? I don't know. But I just got back from Peru, and I'm going back in a couple of months. I just got back from Peru. I'm at uh, Tiwanaku, Pumapuku. I'm in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking around, doing my thing, shooting video, doing this, doing that, exploring, researching, and around the corner. And what do I see? A pillar Mm -hmm. exactly like Gobekli Tepe. Mm -hmm. The hands wrapping around, the belt, the, the gown. Right, everything but the Hermes belt buckle. If that would have been there, I would have lost my mind. But anyway, I'm looking at an exact duplicate of what was found at Gobekli Tepe. This is not coincidence. This is a sharing of knowledge. And again, I would I don't know if it's transoceanic or if there is a master teacher that was traveling the world like Gandalf, you know, wearing a, a robe of all colors, you know, sharing knowledge. I don't know, but but what do you make of that? The purses being everywhere, and and the fact that we have um, uh, humans depicted the same identical way on pillars on opposite sides of the globe a question so the short answer to that is those persons do not exist as far as i've seen in upper pillar cave art in either the iberian peninsula france frank iberian art or south africa so it came after i recognize this i recognize the symbology of it they don't exist and so it, it had to come after I don't. I don't know where it came from, but it did, it did come after. Now let's let's also let's we got to talk about timelines a little bit too, because people. What well, okay, trans- before, let- before we get there, yeah. um, let's stay on the purses for just a second. Sure. Yeah. I I just hosted a panel with Linda Moulton Howe and, mm-hmm. and and Andrew Collins and you know all these big brains sitting there, Matt Lacroix and. Caroline Corey was on the panel, and and you know some pretty big minds and, and researchers, mm-hmm. and I asked of all said Daniel Sheehan was on the panel too as well. I got him to jump in. I asked each one of them individually what they thought the handbags or purses represent. And I got six different opinions, which I love. Let's sure. put it all in the middle of the table. And and no opinion, no opinion here, right? Yeah. Well, so that's so. Burn. What, what? What? What do they represent? What do you think? That's what I. So I have no opinion on what they represent, but I think we need to understand the timeline a little bit. So, people, Native Americans came, lived in Berengia. So the connection, the, the, you know, seven hundred miles north or south spanning between Alaska and what is now former Soviet Union, right? 
people lived there for, for eight, 10,000 years. And then they came down somewhere around 20,000 years ago, maybe 22,000 years ago, right? Came into the, into the century United States, maybe 16, 17. It, those are pretty good numbers, right? It's sure. pre Clovis, okay? But think about these. This cave art, the Iberian Peninsula, we're, we're talking 30, the, 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 We've got solid 34,000 years ago. And they're probably in the region, probably much older than that. So this time period is much is before people migrated into Beringia, lived there, and then migrated south. Okay. So Native American traditions, we can tie many of those because people they carried them for, across and they had the same animals. Okay. Ursa Major is like a popular one. You've probably heard that one, the stories. Okay. So, the, so the timelines, we're so far back in time on the gallery disc and the, the, the cave of bones in South Africa and the pareidolia in these mountains is forever, right? I mean, it's forever, forever. Um, so there's, there's been migrations, there's been movement, but in terms of symbology, I have absolutely freaking no idea. Absolutely no idea. Yeah, I, I it, it. They are trying to tell us something, right? I mean, yeah. it's right there. It's everywhere, holding it, carrying it. It's in the background. It's in the foreground, but it's right there. And to have it so prominent uh, in Gobekli Tepe, uh, above the vulture, on a very significant pillar that I would say definitively is a zodiac. I know I don't think there's any question about that. There's uh, many interpretations, and and that's great. But but to see that in order, um, I, I just can't figure it out. And then you see it represented so many times. So is this handbag handed over? Is it given to different cultures? Is it you know the bag of knowledge? Is it? the nuclear codes <laughs> right now. Know. but you know Jamie, I, I gave you a dozen more than a dozen constellations today i mean i've laid it out in a platter i tied it to the greeks i tied it to the cave heart i mean i did my i did my duty right i mean i can't answer everything and yeah, but yeah I, it doesn't exist <laughs> is it I that in cosmic life? mountains and south yeah, africa I'm, right right you're right. asking for an awful lot i am i am and that's why in and here's Here's what I find so interesting. When, I, you know, you walk around the corner in, in, in Tiwanaku, I'm so familiar and, and studied Gobekli Tepe uh, so much. And when you see a pillar like that, and I'm looking at Gobekli Tepe, it's a, that's when you've got to step back and go, wait a minute. We are not being told the truth. I don't know what the truth is, right? But when you see that, you walk away with more questions than answers. And and I find myself doing the same thing I do with other researchers. Um, uh, for years, Bernie, mm. I've asked the, the different specialists and, and anthropologists, archaeologists, and uh, outside the box, inside the box. So Why? Well, I don't. Well, now that I have traveled the world and seen these sites, I understand that now. Mm -hmm. I don't have all of the answers. I didn't walk away with the keys to the universe. I kind of expected that. But what I did learn is what we are being taught is wrong. Yeah. And it goes back to this nationalist dogma. Jimmy, I need you to do me a, a huge favor. For, for the next 20 seconds, I need you to sing a song. And I need you to do that because I need to replug in my charger. It's just draining like heck. So 20 seconds, do not fail the audience. They're waiting for you to sing a song. Go for it. See, it's not Bernie Taylor. It's Bernie Toppin, Elton John's partner. And he needs a new song. And he needs me to sing right now. And that's not going to happen. It did happen at Conscious Life Expo, though, by the way. I sang on stage. And it was, uh, I did pretty good. I did pretty good. And also, we did happy birthday uh, to uh, Linda Moulton Howe a few times over the weekend. And to hear me sing happy birthday um, is something that is entirely painful but I did it for the spirit of uh, of Conscious Life Expo and singing to Linda Moulton Howe. And so, Bernie, I'm watching Bernie. Can, can you guys see Bernie? Uh, this is the other thing. 
Um, I didn't do this uh, for Bernie during uh, his intro. What did you say? Um, I, I, what I was telling everybody was that you used to roadie for Foreigner on the Double Vision Tour in 1978. And clearly, you know what you're doing on stage. I do? <laughs> okay, no, okay, okay. Let's go back to let's go back to the the. the so you didn't sing a song. I got it. You, you uh, gave oh, a story. Oh, That's oh, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, I, Bernie, the last thing that the world needs is me to sing. You know, <laughs> if, I, if I did sing. I would probably, because I do this so well, I would probably do Barry Gibbs falsetto for um, uh, Saturday Night Fever. I think I would do that. I, I, you can tell that I have that beautiful high voice. You do. You do. You got it. Now, yeah. the big question you, you, I thought you would answer was about the pyramids, the Giza pyramids and, and the Mayan pyramids and the whole stick. But are we going to do that in another show? I'm good. Well, no, do you remember? Do you remember the opening scene in the movie Stargate? And if you don't, I'll not the opening scene, the second scene with James Spader, and he's giving a presentation at a museum in New York, right? And he's got a room full of people, a couple hundred people there. Yes, and I do remember that. Yes, I know this. Yes, yes. yes. And so he raises their Good. hand. And and goes yeah. okay. That's all good. That's all good. But who do you think built the pyramids? And he goes, well, I don't know. And everybody gets up and leaves the room yeah. because that's the question, right? That's yeah. the one. That's the one question the we one. need answered. And so um, uh, I'll be back in Egypt in in a few months. I cannot wait for that. This will be my third trip in two years uh, to Egypt, and. I got to tell you, I, I don't know. I, but what I can tell you is it's not how they've been telling us. Correct. 100% sure. Not correct. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, you're, you think there's a bounty on your head for, for uh, digging around the pyramids looking for a Tiffin Isle inscription. So you probably should watch out where you're going. So, I've, so I've, got a, I've, I've got a pass card at the Giza Plateau. <laughs> I can do what I want. Okay. Yeah, so the pyramids, the pyramids, important, important subject. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna approach this archetypally. So, you've had some Jungian people on your program, I'm sure. Um, so, Jungian, uh, Swiss, Swiss um, psychologist, um, 1800s to early 1900s, absolutely brilliant. If you've ever taken a Myers Briggs test, that's based on the work of Jung. So, you, if you've bought that, you buy this. Right? Okay. So when a young young analyzed the dreams of thousands of people, he found that the two non-organics, we're not talking animals, so two non-organic characters he found in the dreams were a, a body of water of transformation and a mountain. So it's like almost everybody, the two simple the two characters they have in their dreams. And I, I can just see you you were a Billy Joel fan 30 years ago, maybe, you know? Of course, of course. Remember, remember the river of dreams. I do. Billy Joel, this backstory on that, Billy Joel wakes up from a dream and he's he's got this song in his head but he sees he sees in color he actually the sound is in color for him and at that time he's married to to christy brinkley oh. and so he gets out of bed and he, try, he goes to the shower he tries to, sh to get this thing off because he's not a spiritual man he says it in the song and the song he comes out with a song about you know afraid to cross the river he climbs the mountains of faith all this sort of stuff he dreamed that in the same way that Young found the dreams of people crossing rivers of transformation, as well as uh, climbing these these mountains. And we find it in music and poetry and mythology all around the world. We can't escape from it. Escape from it. And when we can't find these mountains in people's dreams, or we can't find it in the terrestrial plane, people built the mountains. So you went you went down to Yucatan, pretty flat, right? Yeah, it's like really flat. And so they built their cosmic mountains to rise above the plane. It's an archetypal signature in our head that we can't escape from. On the Giza Plateau, or actually, we're just, it's flat as heck, right? And all, everywhere everywhere in Egypt, whether it's flat, because you can't build pyramids on hills, right? It just doesn't work. But at the end of the time that they made pyramids, they they because it did end, they went to the Valley of the Kings, and they built 
pe- they built chambers into the mountains in the mountains where they where they laid people to rest and they put their their goods for the great beyond at the top of the ma- at the top of the valley of the kings is a is a pyramidal peak so they went from pe- making pyramids and having um chambers inside them to go into the valley of the kings where they found the cake where they found cake, where they dug into dug into the the mountains that have this pyramidal peak on top nothing changed nothing changed at all and there's nothing changed between that and of the mind people so how far back in time that could that possibly be well if it's in our psychology our archetypal psychology as young would say it's as far as we can go so it would certainly go to jebel tobokal the mountain that the Greeks called Atlas, that was the high, it is the highest mountain in Western in North Africa. Okay. You can go around your world, you can find all these archetypal mountains, these cosmic mountains that people climb for no apparent gain, and, and people could be apparently could be injured. We find these arch Moses Moses climbed the mountain of the Ten Commandments. Jesus was transfigured on Mount Tabor. Um so the Olympians lived, you know, on Mount, Mount Olympus, the abode of the gods. The the Tibetan people believe that mountain that Mount Everest was where the gods held. So we go around the world. Anywhere you go, you will find these cosmic mountains. And if you don't find the mountain, it was a flat plain. People built the mountains. They made them. They made them for the pyramids. They made them um, in the Mayan temples and so forth. Okay. So how far back in time could this go? Well, was it Gunan Punang? How do you say that word? Gunan Gudang Punang. Gudang Gudang Punang. Yes. Okay, Gudan Penang. So there's this there's this narrative out there that Gudan Penang is a pyramidal is a pyramid that's connected to the e- Egyptians. Well, I will say that it's not connected to the Egyptians, but it's connected deeper in time. We can find cave art. Remember, we talked about Indonesia having the oldest cave art about forty five thousand years ago. So there were people that came out with this archetypal psychology that came out of. At, Iberian Peninsula, West North Africa, um, they came into, into Indonesia during that time period. And perhaps they looked at these mountains and they said, well, that one's damn interesting. It's got all those things sticking up. It's different from all the ones around here. That became my cosmic mountain. That is where the hero or the shaman or the teacher or the, the Moses or the Jesus of their time climbed the mountain to reach to meet the great beyond. Okay, because that's what the cosmic mountain is. The cosmic mountain is the, it's a it's a it's a testament of faith. Can you can you reach to the great beyond to the to the gods? And that's exactly what was going on at Jebel Tobolka. We have these constellations and paradoi in, in the mountain. People climb, Hercules climbs the mountain, okay, to to steal the golden apple, the apple of eternity. Um, and so we have this concept of the cosmic mountain all over the place. I would say that the Egyptian the, the Egyptians made these pyramids to be representative of cosmic mountains. Did they have alignments? Of course they had alignments, okay? And people there's all kinds of concepts of what people have in alignments. Now, what is most interesting about the Giza pyramids is that during the time of the ancient Egyptians, which you kind of can't really see now, is they were they were they were um, capped or the whole size were limestone. Let's go back to limestone. In northern Spain and in Sp- and in France, where we have all these caves, they're all limestone mountains. In El Castillo, where we find the, the this gallery of disc, it's a pyramidal shaped mountain, and it's limestone. It looks just like a pyramid in Egypt. Then this is what it gets more interesting. So the the Sphinx, the Egyptian Sphinx, we have a representation of the Egyptian Sphinx in in on the gallery of discs okay and it's an overlapping of two animals okay it's, oh, and the net it ha- even has the broken nose therefore the broken nose didn't wasn't done by napoleon and it has the nemis the nemis is actually part of the the elephant okay well we find the paradoy origin of that the paradoy remember it's not real the paradoy in the mountain where these other animals come from at jebel toboko so they found the they found this paradoy and they brought it to the cave in the El Castillo cave and across this panel. And in ancient times, this and other caves were like the Disneyland. People went to these caves to, to like refine the past. You know, to, to, you know, it was it was the it was the place to be. The Sphinx is it's not a ripoff, it's a redo, it's a remake of an earlier time that was found in Paradoya at Jebel Tobokal that was remade at, at the El Castillo cave. It has the all this. It is. It is the. You can put them side by side. They're exactly the same. So, 
the Egyptians knew about this. And when they said there was a Zept Tepe in an earlier time, they're talking about 34,000. They didn't know it was 34,000 years ago, but they were talking about the El Castillo cave. They didn't know it was Jebel Tobokal. Because if they knew it was Jebel Tobokal, they would have had the art a little differently. It just they would have done it differently. The Sphinx origin comes from the El Castillo cave, which who's, has a Parador origin at Jebel Tobokal. Do you have a linear dating for this? So the, the, the linear, well, the, the, the gallery disc is 34,000 years ago. We can date that based on the, um, the, the panels are all limestone, right? Or no, calcium- I understand, I understand oh. the dating of uh, El Castillo. I'm talking yeah. about the connection between the Sphinx and what is depicted there in the cave because that's 34,000 years ago. Yes. Allegedly, the Sphinx was built around 2700 BC, which we can all yeah, agree. They, 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 the Egyptians did not see Jebel Tobacco. They didn't. And I'm going to tell you why they didn't see Jebel. I'm sorry. They, I'm going to tell you. I know they didn't see it. And this is the reason why. Okay. They w- they saw the gallery of discs. They went to the gallery of discs and they saw this panel, you know, 10, 30 feet across, maybe 12 feet high, right? Okay, and we said one end is north and the other end is south, and in the middle we find the rock of Gibraltar with these marine animals. Okay, and then, well, that's you north to south. Well, and then we talked about the Jebel Tobacal, which is actually at the top of the panel. It kind of runs like a, like a blotch on top of it. We have the, we have the, the Leo the bear, we have the, elf, we have the, the, the elephant, we have, the, uh, I'm sorry, Leo the lion, the elephant, the bears. We got some other animals in there. We got, and we got the, the crocodile, the, as Draco. If you looked, if you didn't, if you didn't know that, so if you went to the Gallery of and you looked at the whole thing, you, what well, would look like, you know, the north, you know, the south, you know, the east, and that'd be west, right? Well, if you saw that thing up there, what would you say? Well, it's a freaking island, because they knew, they knew where the Rock of Gibraltar was, and they knew that paradoxical, because that was old news, right? They knew the animals there, the marine animals. They knew the north, they knew the north because they had the, the horses, and they knew the south that they had the giraffes. Well, if you're going off in that direction to the west, it looks like a freaking, it looks like. It looks like an island, but it's not an island. It's Jebel Tobokal. And in the Plato story, he talks about a place where there's there's elephants. And he talks about it, right? An island with his elephants. And if you look at the side, the, the relative size, if you if you if you if you look at you figure where they are in northern Spain, you figure where the, Ger- the rock of Gibraltar is, it would be approximate, it would be about the distance from the Atlantic Ocean where it meets northern Spain at the top, to the north, and to, to the rock of Gibraltar. It would look like a not like an island, it would be a mini continent. It'd be absolutely huge. It'd be the size of the Iberian Peninsula. So they they looked at it. Now, so the the Egyptians, if they had seen, knew about Jebel Tobacal, they they would have obviously that it's it's there. So Herodotus, going back to Herodotus and San Genato, they knew it was Jebel Tobacal, and that's why they called it Atlas at, the, at Mount Atlas, and that the people there were called the Atlantes. So this, the, 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 the Herodotus had it, the ancient Phoenicians had it, but the, the, the Egyptian, their source, I don't know who their source was, could have been them, could have been somebody else. They mixed, they didn't know that that was Jebel Tobacal. They thought it was an island. Okay. And so therefore, they, if, if they had seen, if the Egyptian, ancient Egyptians, and they also had the pyramidal limestone mountain that is El Castillo, it's, 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 it looks like a pyramid. If they had seen, if they knew Jebel Tobacal, they would have had a different narrative. They wouldn't have made pyramids. They would have made reconstructions of Jebel Tobacal. But they made reconstructions of these, these of these limestone mountains, specifically um, El Castillo Mountain in the north of Spain. Okay. To to I love that, by the way, and I'm yeah. probably going to steal it. And I'm saying that live on the air. So when yeah. I do. Uh, I don't carry the guilt. Okay, but but sure. but if I was going if if I was going to follow that thought, there's a couple of things that mess with it. And number one, the where the bent pyramid. Forget about Giza. And by the way, sure. when you said uh, it, it was the the tribes allegedly uh, came in and leveled the Giza plateau. 18 hectares to build the pyramids on top of it and yeah. the alignments and everything else. Okay. That's crazy town, but just for stone age, man, 
to come in and level off a, a limestone hillet like that perfectly to build the pyramids, eh, I have to pump the brakes right there and say somebody taught them that type of engineering. They just didn't yes. think this off of the top of their heads. But if we back up and look at the Bent Pyramid, which allegedly was built before the Giza Plateau, that sits in the middle of, and the Red Pyramid is a mile away, sure. in the middle of flat sand. There are no mountains. There's nothing. I've walked around it. I have filmed it. I have walked around the entire Bent Pyramid. It took me an hour, by the way. It's ginormous. Anyway, it's perfect. When you look at the Bent Pyramid, it's still finished, right? Uh, the Giza Plateau, uh, what's on the outside is removed. You look at the Bent Pyramid, there is no way that Stone Age man knew how to do that. There's no way you're thinking this off of the top of your head and planning that. You're, you're just, no, no. It, it, it's not a believable set of dogma. Somebody taught them, whether it's from that island you're talking about, whether it was the, the Atlanteans, but somebody brought that in. That's the part that messes with me. But now, if we talk about migration and we back up all of that, Bernie, yeah. Gobekli mm -hmm. Tepe sits to the north. The ability okay. to quarry and to carve and to form and to move megalithic structures was happening, which is now on the Syrian-Turkey border, right? Yep. But it is north. And that would suggest to me, possibly, that the migration came from north to south, not from South Africa, correct. north. That's correct. That, I care for North oh, South. You, you would agree with that? Yes, yes. So I, I would say, well, I would say, it, it, so the migration from North Africa, West North Africa, the Iberian Peninsula was across people swimming, taking boats across Strait of Gibraltar, canoes or something. But then when we're talking Gobekli Tepe we're t and, and Egypt, um, there were multiple sources of information. So I would say that the people at Gobekli Tepe came, were the Basque. I mean, the Armenian Plateau, you knew the story. Um, mm -hmm. That's where they were. Um, the Egyptians came much, uh, obviously, many thousands of years later. And that they they had a direct source, meaning Egyptians went to El Castillo Cave, or they had summoned the Phoenicians, somebody in the middle who made these observations. Now, I had actually made a video of the, the Sphinx connection. I took it down because the sound wasn't really hot. Um, it's called The Riddle of the Sphinx. I have just emailed it to you. And if you want, I'll send you the I just got it. I just got it. I'll send you the live feed. And it's only like, it's less than two minutes. Um, and so the it shows the, the, the exact match, one for one. It's indistinguishable. Um, so the I say people went there were multiple migrations and people kept going back and forth to visit. And there were hubs of information where people sprouted off in different directions. Um, but the Gobekli Tepe, I mean, it, it's within, it's the same time as the cave art ends, Gobekli Tepe rises. So in terms of moving around large stones and megaliths, um, I think that, I think the ancient Egyptians with the pyramid is a pretty huge accomplishment. Um, I'm not convinced that Gobekli Tepe, I mean, it's cool. But, you know, you could probably get a bunch of your buddies and move some pillars around. Uh, no. A 20-ton pillar? No. Yeah, Ain't but not. you're not lifting it. You're not lifting it. You're rolling it. You're rolling the pillars. Yeah, you're rolling. Happening. Nobody's lifting anything. Not happening. Not, not happening. happening. No. Well, look, if we go, I'm just saying, if we go with orth orthodox Archaeology yeah. and sure. anthropology. On uh, nationalistic archaeology. I'm going nationalistic, eh? Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that. Um, the, the the thought of rolling something on rollers, they didn't yeah. do. Allegedly, they were struggling. They didn't even know how to make shoes. So don't tell me, right? Or they make shoes. Or, <laughs> they make shoes. or, or, yeah, right. <laughs> or Everything that you told us was wrong, and there was high technology back then. But rolling stuff around on 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 
uh, circular objects or the the impression of the idea of a wheel and engineering and and weight transfer. No, that was not happening in the ice age. What is the what is a Ford one hundred and fifty truck weigh? Yeah, yeah. By, well, I'm not saying wheels. I'm saying like logs, like logs. But what is a, what is a what is a good sized truck weigh? Oh, I, I'll top. I'll, I'll I'll even. I'll I'll one up you on that. Okay. A semi truck, yeah. semi truck carries yeah. carries sixty thousand pounds. How many okay. tons is that? I have no idea. 60, There's five thousand pounds in a ton. Okay. So how many? How so? That's so twelve. So there is. Don't. I don't want anybody. To, and 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 I'll take you one further. So one of those one of those pillars would break a semi truck. So there wasn't a bunch of dudes out there with hemp ropes pulling this stuff across the sand. That's number one. Number two, yeah. Aswan is five hundred miles south of Cairo. Above okay, the, Egypt now. You jumped. No, you I, jumped. I, in, yeah. You, I, I don't can, know about Egypt. The pillar. I have no can, idea how they built the pillar pyramids. No we, idea. We could do Lebanon. We can yeah. do Malta. We yeah. can do France. We could do yeah. the Orkney Islands. We can do uh, Oye and Te Tambo in Peru. Yeah. Pick a spot. It's all the same issue. Sure. When there is no way you are moving a 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 2,000 ton stone back then, you're not. And And the Egyptians didn't have wood. They didn't have wood. Yeah. They didn't have wood. Any wood in Egypt was cedar from Lebanon. Yeah. There were no trees in Egypt. You would crush a palm tree, so just forget about that. That's just a poor soft wood. But yeah, any Baalbek is an enigma. I'm going to give you that. It's a total enigma. A ball back and I mean, I'm I'm mystified. I'm totally mystified in that one. And, and one last thing, because this yeah. is your specialty. This is what I find fascinating. So the Armenian highlands, people think of Armenia yeah. today, it's this little landlocked country. Yeah. But the Armenian highlands uh, was ginormous, right? Yeah. Okay, so, but in there's a place called, uh, uh, th there is a calendar, a stone, it's called Karahunj, in Armenia predating Stonehenge by 4,000 years. That's in Armenia. In Egypt, you have Nabta Playa, again, predating mm -hmm. the Giza Plateau by thousands sure. of years. And you have Stephen's calendar in South Africa. You have these ideas of astronomy and, and star alignments and sun alignments and counting that predates Mesopotamia and Egypt sure. by some cases yeah. three, four, five, six, seven thousand years. Gnan mm -hmm. Padang was just dated officially at twenty-five thousand years old, right? Mm -hmm. So, what the the knowledge of a calendar and how to use it is is all over the world. Is this again a universal language, or is it just built in our DNA? Well, I don't think I don't believe it's still built in our DNA because ninety nine point nine percent of our DNA is the same as a chimpanzee, and so the chimpanzees can't do this. Chimpanzees can't tell time. I actually do like full presentations on this. We're the only animal that can tell time, and the reason that we can tell time is that we've harnessed the sun, the moon, and the stars. So we can just not just tell time, but we can navigate in time and space. And we learned to do that at least thirty four thousand years ago. But I mean, I can I can peg the date scientifically thirty four thousand years ago, and it wasn't discovered then. It was discovered before we came into into Iberian Peninsula. It was discovered in I would say West North Africa, and it migrated down to South Africa, which is absolutely you know on the incredible scale that I didn't see it coming. I mean, I knew there was a Maasai giraffe. I mean, the, the world's foremost wildlife biologist. That's a Maasai giraffe, and I could never have imagined that this narrative went 34,000 years ago before Picasso, before the Greeks, before Gobekli Tepe, before the Egyptians, before Gobekli Tepe, I mean, going back so far in time, before everything. 
is that there was a culture, culture exchange between the Iberian Peninsula to South Africa, the southern limits, and up into Western North Africa at a place called Jebel Tobacal, the mountain the Greeks called Atlas that the hero Hercules climbed. Why, why do you think, and we'll close with this, it's like the big question, why the big secret? Why is it that our true history just isn't told? I don't yeah. get that. I, I think we are a little sure. bit entitled to know yeah. about the distant past and also the possibilities of of us rising and falling in in the far past and the possibilities of that. But why hide that from us? Because it seems that that's exactly it's, what's yeah. going on. So in my world, in, in this sort of this academic space and over 100 podcasts, I'm out there telling this story and people are clapping. But we go back to the beginning. It was Franco in Spain had a coup over the general, the Democrat, democratically elected government. Um, and Franco's coup was aligned with the Catholic Church, which squashed the whole thing. So this narrative, as as archaeology progressed, they were still stuck in the Dark Ages of that Roman Catholicism, which is not the Roman Catholicism of the United States. These are not the, the you know, the Michael Row You Boat Ashore people, who, who, you know, the, the banjos, the guitars, and the tambourines. S Iber Spain was trapped in time. When all these developments were made, there was no there was no study of there was no study of the possible question because there's only animals, people, and ge geographic symbols that no one will ever understand on the walls of the caves. There are no centaurs. There are no mountains. There are no rivers. There's no rock of Gibraltar. There's no Jabotovacal. These things cannot exist because that is not the patriarchal Spanish tradition. So this is about nationalistic archaeology where we started from there's lots of archaeologists in spain who absolutely love this stuff and would love it and would be you know they clap at the conferences they want to talk about it but they can't because the hierarchical structure which is tied to religion franco and the history of spain the modern history of spain it's all wrapped up together and that's it's the lid on it. And so everybody's running around the world coming up, trying to find out. They see all these links. These links sort of come together, and they, they can't find the source. They couldn't find the source because there was a lid on the source. And Picasso saw the source. Picasso was on it because he took these images of these animals in the cage, caves, and he projected them as, as human characters. And Picasso also captured the astronomy in some of his paintings, including Guernica. And that's a whole new program. But he carried, he took a Paleolithic cave images, the characters, the animus, the characters in the animals, projected those as modern humans, and lined them up with, with astronomy. Bernie, amazing conversation tonight, my friend. Just a absolutely perfect show. Where can everybody go and chase you down? Sure, before Orion.com. And I just uploaded, I just actually re opened up to public the, the riddle of the Sphinx. Sphinx. And you can go, you can look at the Sphinx, you can see the Egyptian Sphinx, you can see the El Castillo Sphinx, and you can see the paradoia origin of that Sphinx at Jebotabokal, the mountain the Greeks called Atlas, that the hero Hercules climbed. Thank you so much. I look forward to our next conversation, Bernie. Perfect show. Thank you so again. much. You got it. That That is why I do Fade to Black right there. Bernie J. Taylor. His links are below. Okay, so everybody can uh, head right over before Orion.com. We've got the links in the comments over in social media and on our website. All right, now, what am I doing tomorrow night? Does anybody know? What am I doing tomorrow night? Tomorrow night? Oh, Sev Talk is with us tomorrow night. Bernie kicking off the week. Tomorrow night, Sev Talk. Thursday, Dr. Damon Abraham. What a great show tonight. I'm back from CLE. I'll see everybody tomorrow night. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. 
Thank you, Bill. Thank you, John Aside. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Thank you to Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black of the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Sev Talk, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.